All right, so chapter 17 is the appraisal chapter or the value chapter. Um, this is the last sort of big hurdle we've got in the class. Um, it is mostly a math-based chapter, and the reason for that is appraisal is a math question. So you, we're talking about what is a property worth? That's always going to be a math-based question. And we're going to talk about the different ways that we can determine what the value of a particular property is. That's what appraisal is really all about. So an appraisal, and you need to know this definition for the test. It's a formal opinion of value. That word formal is important because we, as real estate brokers, are also expected to give an opinion of value. That's another big point for the test. It is expected, it's part of your duties as a real estate broker. Remember back in chapter seven we talked about loads, the, the duties that we owe to our clients versus our customers. One of those duties that we owe to our clients is an opinion of value. We always owe our clients, whether they're buyer clients or whether they're seller clients, we owe them an opinion of value, unless we're in what kind of an agency relationship. When will we not give our opinion of the value of the property? If we were in dual agency, because again, that would be considered advice. So, um, other than a dual agency transaction, we always owe our opinion of the value of the property. Whether we represent the buyer, the seller, a landlord, a tenant, doesn't matter. Whatever our relationship is, we owe them an opinion of value. But our opinion of value is not an appraisal. Appraisals are done by appraisers, by licensed appraisers. That's why their opinion is called a formal opinion. The other big thing to remember here is that any opinion of value, including appraisals, are only good for one day. Market value changes by the day because the market changes by the day. You, you can't take an appraisal that's two years old and say that it's relevant now. Does that make sense for everybody? So when we talk about appraisal or opinions of value, we say they're only good for the day they're conducted. Now, if we know in practicality we may close a loan and the appraisal may have been conducted three weeks before the loan actually closes and they're still going to rely on it because that's close enough in time. But for test taking purposes, if you ever see that, any opinion of value like an appraisal is only good for the day it was done, that one day. That's it. All right? As far as our opinions of value go as real estate brokers, they're called one of two things, either a CMA or a broker price opinion. Now this is a North Carolina specific rule. This is going to show up in the North Carolina specific section of the exam to know the difference between a CMA and a broker price opinion. Okay? A CMA is something you do for a client. A BPO is something you do for a customer. Now they might be the same opinion. If you were valuing a property, you probably have the exact same number for a CMA as you do a BPO. It's not that the process is different, the name of it is different based on who you're doing it for. And here's why. If you're doing an opinion of value for a customer, you're probably not doing it for free. You're probably what? Charging a fee for that service. Because a customer is somebody that you don't represent. If you don't represent, you're not making any money off of that person. Does that make sense to everybody? Whereas a CMA, generally when you do a CMA for a client, you're not charging them for that because it's just part of your overall service. Does that make sense to everybody? But if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, you China, I just want you to tell me what this house is worth. They're not asking her to sell it for them. They're not asking her to help them buy it. She's probably going to look at them and say, okay, well, how much are you going to pay me for that? You know, do you just expect me to work for free? And could she negotiate some amount of money for that? She could, and it would be called a broker price opinion. Here's what you need to know about BPOs, though. They can only be done by non-provisional brokers. That's the last sort of thing we're going to put as a restriction on provisional brokers. What are the other things we've talked about that provisional brokers could not do? A non-provisional broker can, but a provisional cannot. What are they? Think to landlord and tenant. Mm, see, we just 
Okay, so that's going to be good. Leases, we can deal with. Yeah. Property, property management. Property management. Provisional brokers cannot be property managers. I'm pretty sure that's the very first thing on the slide deck in that property management chapter is that provisional brokers cannot be property managers, right? Provisional brokers can't be property managers. What else can a provisional broker not do? It has to do with designated dual agency. They can be designated against their broker in charge. And then the last thing that provisional brokers can't do has to do with active status. What can a provisional broker not do in regards to being on active status that a non-provisional broker can do? Different can't be can't be with different firms, right? And can't, you, they can't be on active status without a broker in charge. Whereas a non-provisional broker can be on active status without a broker in charge. Remember all those? So they're, they're, that's sort of a little list of things that provisional brokers can't do. So they can't do property management. They can't do. Um, designated dual agency against the broker in charge. They can't do uh, or can't be on active status without a broker in charge. As Bud said, they can only have one broker in charge, which means they can't affiliate with different firms. A non-provisional broker can do that. And then last thing here, some sort of number five is they can't do what? They can't do uh, broker price or fee for a charge a fee for a broker price opinion. They cannot do that as a provisional broker. So if you wanted to charge fees for doing BPOs, what would you need to do? Complete your what? Classes. Your which, which classes? Post-licensing post -license. post classes. You would need to complete your post-licensing classes and get rid of that provisional status. Three 30-hour 30 30 post-licensing classes, at least one by each license what? Anniversary. Anniversary. Good. It's important to know those rules because you're going to see those on the test. You're going to see you know, different statements about, and you got the reason I have to say, you can't just say classes because there's two different types of classes, right? There's post-licensing and then there's what? Continuing. Continuing education, and they're different. They're different things. Okay? <laughs> post-licensing for provisionals. Post-licensing for provisionals. Post-licensing for provisionals, right? All right? BPOs only indicate something called a probable sales price. Anytime you give an opinion of value, you shouldn't say to either a client or a customer, if you're talking to a client, are you giving a CMA or a BPO? Client would be what? CMA. CMA. If you're talking to a customer, it would be a BPO. But no matter which one you're talking to, when you give your opinion of value, you don't say, well, the property is worth this. Don't say that. Or the property is valued at this. What you say is this is the, proper, the property's probable selling price. That's the magic words they want you to use. This is the probable sales price of the property. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Probable sales price. Now these next couple of slides are really just for reference purposes. You don't need to memorize anything. I'm going to point out some things that are more important as we go through. But these are just things that affect value. And the reason they affect value, the more demand there is for something, what does the value of that thing do? If it's more demand, it goes up. The more useful the property is, what does the value do? It goes up. The more scarce the value goes up, and the more easily transferred the property is. Here's what we mean by that. If you go all the way back to like chapter 2, if you have like a fee simple determinable deed, is that going to really limit the value of the property? Yeah. Yes. Fee simple determinable, why? Because they're going to determine what you can do. They have already predetermined what you can do with the property. So that restriction on being able to transfer unlimited ownership of the property, what does it do to the value? It drops it tremendously. Does that make sense? So that's what we mean about transferability affecting value as well. Now, some terminology you do need to be familiar with. Market value versus market price versus cost. You're going to see these terms and you need to know what they mean on a test. Market value is what we do. In other words, it's a prediction. It's a guess. 
That's what we do. That's what appraisers do when they're trying to predict the market value of a property. The market value is an opinion of what the property might sell for, what it might sell for. That prob that's why we use words like probable selling price. Probable means likely, right? It's a prediction. Whereas market price is what it actually sells for. So market value is a prediction. Market price is what it actually did. Like if you think back to property management, remember we had the difference between an operating budget and a cash flow report. What was the difference between the two? The, the budget was a what? An estimate or prediction, whereas the cash flow report was what it actually did. Same difference here. A market value is a prediction, so like an appraisal would be a market value, a CMA or a BPO would be a market value, an actual closed sales price would be a market price. Make sense for everybody? Okay. And then cost. Cost is literally what something costs, which has no impact whatsoever on its value. If you had a dollar for every time in your career you're going to hear somebody say, but I paid so-and-so for it, you'd be rich and you wouldn't even need to get the license. It doesn't matter what they paid for it. That's its cost. The next buyer doesn't care what it costs. The market dictates its value based on what a buyer is willing to pay for it, not what you pay for it or what the previous owner paid for it. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So we don't factor cost in um, in most cases when we are determining the value of a property. Um, highest and best use. The highest and best use, which we already talked about way back in chapter one, is the one thing that we can do with the property at any given time that gives us the best return on our investment. So it's the one use, the one way we could use that property that's going to bring the best return on our investment. This is actually an appraiser's first job. When they go out and look at a property to determine its value, the first thing they determine is what should the property be used for? Because could it, its best, highest and best use be different than what it's currently being used for? Yeah, so the first question an appraiser has to ask, ask themselves when they go out to a property is, what is the highest and best use of this property? It's usually going to be the current use, but it could be different. could be different. Okay? You might see this principle of value on a test. The next two in particular, substitution and conformity. The principle of substitution is sort of the basis for all things when it comes to value. I call it the Walmart principle. Here's what the principle of substitution says. If a buyer has a choice between two things that are relatively equal, which one will they almost always buy? The cheaper one. That's why I call it the Walmart principle, right? Uh, Walmart's not built on their customer service, that's for sure. They're, they're built on being the cheaper option. And so what we know about consumers is when they're faced with two relatively equal choices, they will almost always buy the cheaper one. And that becomes the basis for us determining value on things because if we look at something we say, well, a buyer was willing to pay X number of dollars for this and the thing we're trying to sell is very similar, then a buyer should also be willing to pay X number of dollars for that. Does that make sense for everybody? And that's what we're doing. We're substituting one thing for another as long as they're very similar. The principle of conformity is simply that you're going to get the best return on your investment when you match your surroundings. From a real estate perspective, conformity is a wonderful thing when it comes to maximizing investment. Here's what we mean by that. If you think about properties that stick out like a sore thumb, are they going to be valued highly or are they probably not going to be as well valued as maybe they otherwise would be? They're going to be valued less in most cases. And they could stick out in either direction. Could they be over-improved and, and too nice for their surroundings? Or not nice enough for their surroundings? So generally speaking, we're going to get the best return on investment when we conform. Um, the principle of contribution is super important because it talks about that idea of cost. The principle of contribution is simply this the value of any single improvement on a property. And what's an improvement on a property? Is a fireplace an improvement? Yeah, is a garage an improvement? A, a pool is an improvement? The value of any improvement on a property is not related to its cost. It's related to what a buyer is willing to pay for that improvement. 
substitution. That's it's very similar to the idea of substitution, right? Or the, the opposite approach is also true here. The value of that thing is also equal to what they won't pay for the property if it's not there. So for example, if you're trying to value a home that does not have a garage, or if you're trying to value a home that does have a garage. Either way, no matter which, I'll keep talking while I change um, If you're trying to value a home that, say, has a garage or doesn't have a garage, it really doesn't matter. What would you try to find in order to determine the value of the garage? As far as, like, if you're looking at things that sold recently, what kind of, what two houses would be perfect to give you the indication of what the garage is worth? A comparable house. One that with sold garage. with a garage and one that was. And one that sold without a garage. Would it make sense that if you could find those two properties and compare them, you could probably figure out what a garage itself would be worth? Does that make sense for everybody? That is this principle of contribution. I know I don't need it for you guys, but the, it helps with the video sound. All right, what we're going to talk about in this chapter is the three different approaches to value, the three different methods. You could substitute the word method there. Appraisers have three tools in their toolbox when they go to decide what the value of a property is. Now, the truth is they're going to use all three on any property. As an appraiser, when you go out to value a property, they're going to use all three methods if they possibly can. Ultimately, though, we know in advance which method is going to work best for which types of property. And so for us, we, as brokers, because we're not doing a full appraisal, we're just going to shortcut it and we're only going to do the method that makes the most sense for the kind of property we're trying to value. Does that make sense for you guys? We don't do all three on every property. So if we're trying to value a house, based on the descriptions that are up here, which approach are we going to use or which method are we going to use? Sales. The sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach is going to, and you, so you need to know these descriptions of which approach works the best for each different type of property. So the sales comparison approach is going to be the best method for residential property and for vacant land. The cost approach is going to be the best method for special use properties. So special use properties would be things like churches or schools or police departments, fire departments, libraries, public buildings, um, things that aren't residential but also don't make money. Those would be special use properties and that we would use the cost approach. The last one is the income approach or income capitalization approach. What kind of properties do we own that are designed to produce income? Any type of income producing property, right? Which would be rental properties, which would be... So let me ask you a question. Could I own a house that would be best valued using the income capitalization approach? Yes. If I own it for what purpose? For rental purposes, then it's an income producing property and I'm going to use the income capitalization approach to value it. Yes, ma'am. So would commercial property fall then under income capital capitalization? Commercial property would, absolutely. What else? What else other than commercial property? Would agricultural property fall under the income capitalization approach? Mm -hmm. it, pretty much anything that is owned for the purpose of making money. If you own it in order to make a return, if you generate money as a result of owning it, then the value of it is going to be based on that income capitalization approach for your purposes. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And what we mean by that is an income producing property is only as good as the what that it produces? The income. We really don't care how big it is and how many square feet it is and how pretty it is and how awesome it is. All those things may matter in a residential purchase, but they don't matter in 
uh, an investment purchase. And in an investment purchase, the only thing that matters is the return on that investment. Does that make sense? So we, we go back to that same formula we looked at in the property management chapter, that before tax cash flow formula, and we basically look at how much income this thing produces, and that's going to give us a value of it. We're, we're using the income it produces to estimate its value. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So first one is the sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach, as we said, is the best used method for determining value in residential property and vacant land. Don't forget the vacant land part. Okay, it's not just residential, it's vacant land. And here's the sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach is what you do every day of your life when you shop for stuff. When you shop for stuff, what do you do? You compare. You compare us and shop. Don't you? you try to find the cheapest? You try to compare features. And then when you figure out what features you want, you look and see where it's available and where you can get it the cheapest. Does that make sense? And a lot of what you base your opinion of value on is what other people have already paid for the same thing. Does that make sense? That is the sales comparison approach. And it can be used in real estate very effectively. We call those comparisons comps. They're called comparable properties or comps. And so we want to talk about the idea of selecting comps and then what we do to make adjustments for those comps. So choosing comps, this is going to be tested on the exam because this is one of the places where brokers really don't do a good job sometimes in the real world, is choosing appropriate comparable properties. What do you think comparable means? As what is possible? As similar as possible. So let's first talk about the, the terminology here. Subject property is the property you're trying to do what? To, to come up with a value for, right? Your subject property is the one that's in question. We want to know what this property is worth. That's our subject property. Our comparables are the properties that we are going to compare back to our subject property. Does that make sense for everybody? And we're going to get the best indication of value by choosing comparables that are as similar as they can possibly be. Everybody okay with that description? To the, to the subject property. As similar as they can possibly be to the subject property. So just let me make sure your brain's in the right place. What kind of residential properties are you likely to be able to do a slam dunk CMA on where you know you can find ultra similar recently sold comparable properties. Same neighborhood, get more specific. What a specific type of residential property? Like a new development. Get more specific than that. What kinds of residential properties are all the same? Or maybe hundreds of get Condos. more tighter than that. Tighter than townhouses. Go one step further. Condos? Condos. Think about condos. It's 200 boxes stocked on top of each other. They're all exactly the same size with the same features and the same floor plan and the same. I mean, they are identical to one another. If, you, if you're looking at trying to value a condo, how long should that CMA take you to do? About three minutes. <laughs> right? Because there's not going to be a bunch of variation there. See, variation is the devil when you start doing a CMA. Because when you start talking about variation, then you introduce, well, we don't really know how accurate we are anymore. Does that make sense? So with condos, you're going to find a bunch of extremely similar properties that have recently sold. So you're going to be able to come up with a really quick, really accurate value for that property. Is that making sense for you? So there, go to the other end of the spectrum. Where is it going to be the hardest to come up with good comps? Rural and remember, areas. you're only doing this in residential property. Say that again. Rural areas. Rural areas. That's a hard word to say, isn't it? I grew up in a, I grew up in a rural area. Rural, rural, rural. Like, you know, it's very hard to say rural. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I struggle with the pronunciation of that word. I always feel like I sound like a moron when I say it. I don't know, but I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. But very rural areas are going to be extremely difficult to do a good CMA in because you may not find even remotely similar properties. And so it's important to remember the rule is to find the most similar possible. Sometimes the most similar possible aren't all that similar. 
Does that make Does that make sense? But you got to get whatever is most similar. Yes, ma'am. Expounding on that, um, because on the street where I live, you know, I run um, and I have like a five mile loop, and in that five mile loop, there's how big is the bear home. chasing you that makes you run five <laughs> miles? That's what I want. There's some big dog. Um, you know, there's this two or three like just mansions, you know, and then mm -hmm. there's old ranches, mm -hmm. new ranches, you know, I mean, so how how far do you cast the net of okay, I mean because I live oh. in a very rural area. So right. I mean you could go maybe fifteen miles over, you're still in the same school district. Mm -hmm. You're in the same, you know, relative area you have access to all the same things mm -hmm. so i mean is so, it fair right, to cast that far absolutely so you just made the case for why it's fair to cast that far notice what she said you're still even though it's 15 miles away you're still in relatively the same area you have access to relatively the same amenities or lack thereof which whichever <laughs> it may be you're in the same school district you're the same distance from you know probably shopping and those things so you know, is 15 miles too far? Well, there's no such thing as too far. You go as far as you have to to find similar properties. What you wouldn't want to do is compare that, you know, 1960s rancher to that McMansion that's been right. built two miles down the road just because it happens to be two miles down the road. You, you see what I mean? So you, realistically, the answer is always we want to find the most similar things we possibly can, whatever that entails. And that's why CMAs are always harder in rural areas. They really are, They're because you don't have a lot of similarities with properties that are close to each other. And you may have to expand the net. Now, in an area, in Cary, for example, where should you always start with when you're doing a CMA in a place like Cary? Same what? Same neighborhood. Same neighborhood. Same neighborhood. And maybe even same street within a neighborhood, you know, because you may find, would you, could you find comps maybe on the same street? You know, and so the, the, the tighter you can be, the better your comps are going to be. But you also have to, you know, you have to keep spreading out till you find what makes the most sense. Um, how about, uh, I, and I don't know how it is up here, but, you know, we uh, live very close to the military. Mm -hmm. And you can have a neighborhood that's gorgeous. We have a lot of pop-up neighborhoods. Um, and the, the homes are beautiful. They're just gorgeous. 300000 to 500000 um, However, the destruction that happens can be shocking. So do you need to know what the interior of the home looks like as well? And how Absolutely. do you find that out? I mean, do you look online like Zillow, old Zillow ads or? Well, presumably if you're doing a CMA, you're doing it for your who? Your client. Your client. So you've either been hired by the sellers to list the property or you're representing a buyer who's thinking about making an offer on the property. So presumably you've seen the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and We've seen the inside of their house, but oh, you're talking say about they the take phenomenal care you, you, of theirs. You're, looking at, you're going to look at old MLS pictures. Okay. So when you go back and you find your comparable properties, you're most likely you're looking in the MLS and you're going to look at the old images and see what that property looked like mm -hmm. at the point in time that it was sold. Because really it doesn't matter what condition those properties are in now. What matters is the condition they were in when they were sold because that's when the value was established for those properties. But if it's deteriorated tremendously, then the homes in that neighborhood would begin to decline. So, but I guess that, that would be after they bought the house. Still though, right, again, like, you're looking at the point in time that it was sold. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you don't want to be going back, it shouldn't have deteriorated much, because you're not, I mean, you're not going back in time two years here, you know. Ideally, you'd like to stay very recent. You know, very similar, very recent. Three months is a is a great time frame, but in rural areas, you may have to stretch out to a year. You know, you know something like that. But um, more more the more similar and more recent, the better okay. it's going to be when you're choosing comparables. Now, for test taking purposes, same neighborhood if possible, same style. That's really important on a test. Remember when we talked about square footage, and we talked we talked about the fact that ranches really were not comparable to other styles of homes. So when you're looking at a test and they ask you a question about choosing comps, be very aware of the style of the home. Does that make sense for everybody? Be very aware of the timing involved. You know, you don't want to go back in time too very far, you know, if you don't have to. So for example, I'd rather have, 
a very similar home in a, in a neighborhood that's down the street, not, not, not same neighborhood, but neighborhood that's down the street, if that neighborhood is a similar neighborhood and this is a similar house and it sold three months ago, I'd rather have that than a than house in the same neighborhood that sold 18 months ago. Does that make sense for everybody? Because time really does have an impact as well. Because you want that snapshot. Remember, an appraisal is only good for today, so we want our snapshot to be as close to today as we possibly can. So you're saying the shorter the time. Shorter the time, the better. The, most, the more recent, the better. The more similar, the better. And there's, there's always going to be a balance in that. This is a very subjective thing. Could two appraisers do an appraisal and come up with different comps? Yes, that happens a lot. It happens all the time, you know, where you got one appraiser who comes up with this value and you say, well, where did your numbers come from? And they say, well, here are the comps I use. And you're like, well, I didn't use that one or that one. And so then there becomes a debate about what are the most appropriate comps. There's no magic answer here. There is no magic answer. Um, but I would tell you on a test, they're probably looking, are you paying attention to the same style? Are you paying attention to timing? And don't ever use a comp, ever, 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 that it identifies as on the market. Because a comp that's on the market is not a comp. We don't have any point of comparison because it hasn't done what? Sold. It hasn't sold. We don't know what its value is, so we certainly can't use it as a point of comparison for our value until it sells. So don't ever use a comp that's identified as being on the market. The other thing to pay attention to in the real world and on a test is what we call special circumstances. The, the trend, don't use things as comps it sold in two days for cash. Well, if it sold in two days for cash, it, was that likely like the highest and best value or was that somebody who needed to move something quickly? Somebody who needed to move something quickly. Um, it was sold to the seller's nephew. Would that be a good comp to use? Why not? They probably discounted it to that person. So make sure you look at special circumstances. If you're in a neighborhood where there's only been one foreclosure in the last two years, would you want to use that foreclosure as a comp for your property? No. That, that's the kind of thing we mean. to look at the circumstances of the sale. Now, the real art of doing a CMA or a sales comparison approach is making adjustments to the property. Making these adjustments is going to be the key to answering the math questions appropriately and understanding what you're doing. An adjustment is simply an up or down dollar figure to try to equalize the properties. It's very rare, unless we're talking about condos, that we're going to find perfect matches. When you start looking for comps, as we were just talking about, you're going to start to have to start trading things off. Well, it's this far away, or it's this, you know, it's. it's it's this much smaller, it's this much bigger. Are there going to be set, you know, square footage differentials, for example? Absolutely. We need to make adjustments for that. We can't just ignore the fact that, for example, our subject property is 200 square feet smaller than our comparable property. Because the truth is, if the comparable property was 200 square feet larger, it's probably going to be true that it's worth more money. Does that make sense for everybody? So you can't just say, well, our subject's worth the same thing as that comp, even though the comp was 200 square feet bigger. What would you think naturally? Well, your subject's going to be worth what? Less, because it's smaller. That is the art of the adjustment. Now, when we talk about making adjustments, the whole idea is to make the properties more equal to one another. The other thing you need to recognize is you cannot adjust the subject property. That is the cardinal rule of doing a CMA. You do not adjust your subject property. You adjust your comps to fit your subject, not the other way around. Don't monkey around with the subject property. In other words, if I had that situation I was just talking about where the comp, where the comp was 200 square feet bigger than the subject, I'm not going to add 200 square feet to the subject. I'm going to do what? I'm going to take 200 square feet away from the comp. I'm always adjusting back to the comp. I'm moving toward the comp. The comp is always my target. My adjustments always move 
toward the subject property. Does that make sense? Adjust the comp back toward the subject. Is everybody good on that? So, this says here, if the comparable property is better than the subject, you adjust the sales price of the comp down. If the comparable property is worse than the subject, you adjust the sales price of the comp up. One thing to condition yourself with here. I'm going to give you a meaningless statement. And I want you to turn it into a meaningful statement. The subject property is $3,000 better than the comp. That's a meaningless statement. You know why it's a meaningless statement? Because I can't adjust what? The subject property. I have to restate that. Which one am I going to be adjusting? The comp. So I don't need to know that the subject property is $3,000 better than the comp. What do I need to know? The comp is $3,000 worse than the subject. Anytime they give it to you as the subject is this, you need to flip it around as the comp is that. Does that make sense? Because that's the only way you can actually do these adjustments because you're always adjusting the comparable property. Never deal with language. So if it says the subject property has a debt the comp, that the comp does not have, that's a meaningless statement. Flip it around the other way. So I'm going to say it again. The subject property has a debt that the comp does not have. Say it the other way. The comp what? The comp does not have a debt that the subject does have. You've always got to restate it from the perspective of the comp because that's where you're making your adjustments. And you'll see what I mean when we get to the math questions about that. Because the math of this is super easy. It's plus and minus. Super easy. But very commonly missed questions because you know what you do? You go in the wrong direction. You plus when you should minus. You minus when you should plus. So it's about always making the adjustment in the appropriate direction, okay? So in that regard, I want, I'm going to introduce you to my stupid trick. And yes, it's a stupid trick. And yes, it's an effective one. Yes, you look dumb doing it. Yes, it will help you get the questions right. So I want you to hold up your left hand in front of you, okay? Your left hand is your subject property. Here's what we know about the subject property. It does not adjust. It's always in the same place. It's always locked right here. Does that make sense to everybody? It can't go up. It can't go down. It is in the same place. It never moves. It never moves. So whatever position you have it in right now, you better make sure that's a comfortable one because every time you do one of these questions, when you start, this is your subject. I don't care if the subject is 27,000 square feet. It ain't up here, it's right here because the subject is always, whatever the starting point of this subject is, that's your starting point. Does that make sense for everybody? So with whatever you're trying to adjust for, whether it's square footage or whatever, let's just say square footage in this case because that's the example we used earlier, okay? We said that our we said that our comparable property was 200 square feet larger than our subject property. Isn't that the statement we made earlier? So here's the subject. Where's the comp? Comp's in your other hand. Is it the same? Is it better? Or is it worse? Where is it in relation? Better. It's better. It's 200 square feet larger. Notice I did not move this one, right? I only It takes two hands to do this. You can't do it with one. Because you always got to have a reference point. And here's your reference point. My comp is 200 square feet larger than my subject. Which way do I have to adjust? Keep in mind, I can only move one of these things. Which way do I have to adjust to make them equal? Down. Down. It's a negative adjustment. And it's made on which side of the transaction? On which, which property? The comp is adjusted down to the level of the subject. What that means is on your CMA, that's going to be a negative number. That's going to be a minus number. Does that make sense for everybody? So let's say a garage. Subject has a two-car garage. Comparable does not have a garage. Well, subject's always right here, right? So what's in this hand as far as garages go? Two-car. Two That's our starting point. Where's my comp does not have a garage, so where is it? 
Down here works. So which way is that adjustment going to work? Okay. Up. That's going to be a positive adjustment because I'm adjusting the comp up to the level of the subject. That makes sense so far? I'm excited. You're excited about that one? Good. I finally got it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Once it clicks, you'll never miss another one of those questions. And it is, it is sometimes shockingly hard to get that to click. But once it clicks, you're there. You know, you're there with these questions. So here's an example, just a, 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 a very simple example. It says, in attempting to value the property at 123 Main Street in Garner, Diane finds a very similar comparable property that sold for $150,000 last month. The home at 123 Main Street has three full baths, but the comparable property only has two. Okay? Full baths in the area are valued at $8,000 each. Based on this information, what is the indicated value of the subject property? So we, we need to adjust for how many things here? Yes. The bathroom. Does everybody see that? That's the only difference they've identified. And I'm going to show you how to set this up, make a chart for yourself here in just a second. But in this case, they've only given us one adjustment that needs to be made. My subject property is right here. How many baths does my subject property have? Three. Three. That's my starting point. How many baths does my comparable property have? Two. Two. So we're starting down here, correct? Which way are we adjusting? Uh -huh. Up by one what? Uh -huh. One bath. And what did they tell us the value of one bath is? $8,000. What's my starting point? What my comparable what? What it sold for. That's my starting point. That's where the adjustment is getting applied. So what do we know about that comparable property? It sold for how much money? $150,000, which way did I say my adjustment was going? Uh -oh. Up, so plus, how much money? $8,000. And so what is the indicated value of 123 Main Street based on that one comparable property? $158,000. Just based on that one comp and that one adjustment, the indicated value is 158. So what you're always doing is taking whatever your comp sold for, and then you're doing adjustments that are either going to go up or down from that number. Does that make sense? So if it was identical, what would your estimate of value be? It would be exactly what the comp sold for if you didn't make any adjustments. But usually we have to make adjustments. All right, so let's talk about some other common adjustments. You okay, Christine? A puzzled look. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just wanted to. I mean, I don't like. I, I get in a test, I'll probably give you this, but like, where would you come up with that eight thousand dollars? You would. In a test, they're going to give it to you. But like, if I wanted to apply this in real life, mm -hmm. where would I? How do you find the information out? Um, just it's, it, 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 well, <laughs> what you will learn is that number one, it's very subjective. Number two, your question is the best question that could possibly be asked. So I'll go back to what we talked about earlier, that principle of substitution. If I was trying to figure out how much that bathroom was worth, what I would try to find is two houses in that same neighborhood that had sold, and one was three baths and one was two baths, and then look at what? The difference in the sales price. So you're like comping your comps. That's exactly right. Okay. Because the difference in sales price between those two is the best indication we have of what a, a bathroom is worth in that neighborhood. Does that make sense? That's, in a perfect world, that's where those numbers come from. Okay. You know, if you could find two pretty identical houses, that one was three baths and one was two, and this one sold for 160 and this one sold for 152 well, that bathroom must have been worth $8,000 to somebody. And so then you would take that $8,000 and apply it to this adjustment. Okay. The good news is on the test, most questions they would simply give you the $8,000 and expect you to be able to apply it up or down. That help you though mentally get over that hump? Yeah. And that's the way it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like the math is a little easy compared to like what you're going to have to actually do. So I don't, well, I, I, the, it's a little the math is like, very easy. The okay. math is very easy as long as you make the adjustments in the correct direction. The, the, as far as what you actually do, the truth is it is almost impossible to do a CMA unless you really know the market. 
because you need the experience of the market to be able to say, well, in this neighborhood, bathrooms are worth about $8,000. Okay. And that only comes with having seen a bunch of transactions in a neighborhood like so that. So something like this, you really need to um, kind of hook up with somebody that you feel is, is experienced. very well experienced in this area Absolutely. and has done a good job. Absolutely. The other person you could hook up with would be an appraiser themselves. And, okay. You know, to, to find an appraiser, develop a good relationship with, where you could ask those questions. So like for example, what would what would you need an appraiser for in your line of work as a real estate broker? What service that we talked about that appraisers could offer you would be very beneficial? It's something that either you or they have to do. Square footage. Square footage. So listing a property. So couldn't you, you know, hide you know, talk to an appraiser and say, listen, I'd be interested in hiring you to measure all my listings. By the way, can I give you a call if I have a question about a certain price adjustment that I'm not sure about in a certain neighborhood? Would that be a good resource? Say, Yes, ma'am. Oh, but go ahead. So, really, a uh, month or so ago, I had to look at a CMA, I guess, maybe an appraiser had done. Mm -hmm. You have that that would actually might be helpful to, at some point for them. Yeah, I could pull out a, I could pull out a CMA. Because they do the three comparables, and then you see it's kind of confusing if you don't. Well, when you're looking at an appraisal, it is confusing yeah. because it's on a, a, a certain federal form it has to be on. But then you can actually see these like adjustments being made. The adjustments. I was like, oh, that's why he did that. Oh. Yep. Right. Yep. We can do that. Okay. Is everybody so far so good on the basic math of the adjustment? So the most common adjustments that you might encounter here, number one is going to be square footage. Square footage is most commonly going to be the biggest because it's the most obvious one, just size of the home. And usually, they're going to give you a dollar per square foot value. So in our case, the example we started with, we said the subject property was here and the comparable property was 200 square feet larger, correct? So which way do we need to adjust? Down. Down by the value of 200 square feet. Does that make sense? We need to take whatever the value of 200 square feet. Well, on a test question, they would probably give you that value. Say if they told you that square footage was worth $75 a square foot, you would simply go 200 square feet times $75 a square foot, and then that would be your negative adjustment, would be negative $15,000. So that would be $15,000 negative adjustment that you would make. That makes sense for everybody? Okay. That's a square footage adjustment. Here's an example of that. It says, in conducting a CMA for 402 Oak Drive, we find a recently sold comparable property that has 1,950 square feet of living area for $287,000. Finished living area is valued at $110 per square foot in the area. If we measure the subject property and find it has 1,800 square feet of living area, what is the probable sales price? So I'm going to show you how visually I prefer to set this up to make sense for myself of these adjustments. What I always like to do is write down sub, like a little chart for myself. I've got my subject property, I've got my comparable property, and then I've got the starting point for my comparable property. What did our comparable sell for here? 287000 $287,000. That makes sense for everybody? And then I'm just going to make a chart of things that we're adjusting for. So right now, the only thing we know is living area. How big is my subject property in that question? 1,800 square feet. So I'm going to put 1,800 right here. How big is my comparable property? 1,950. Does everybody see that? So I'm going to put 1950 here. Now, it's time to figure out, before I do any math, it's time to figure out which direction I'm going. Because my goal right now is just to write a plus or a minus. Does that make sense? We're going to do the math and see how much the plus or minus is after. But let's get the direction right first, because the direction is the most likely place to make a mistake. My subject property, how many square feet do I have? 1800. My comp, how many do I have? 1950. So we're starting like this, right? Which way do we adjust? Down. Down. All right. So now we know that's going to be a negative number. Whatever it is, it's negative. Does that make sense for everybody? So I'm just going to write the negative sign there. Now I'm going to figure out how much of a negative it is. Well, how many square feet do I need to take away? 150. All right. 
and they tell us that square footage is worth what? $110 per square foot. So what does that give us? $16,500? So that's $16,500. And so here's how we do it on my chart. That's minus $16,500. And that gives me an indicated value of $270,500 because I'm just starting here and then I'm subtracting that number. Everybody follow me on that? Now, here's why I like to set it up in this chart. As we progress, you're going to be doing uh, adjustments for more than one thing. You're, probably, you're going to get to a point where the test question is, is going to be like five or six different things you have to make adjustments for. The nice thing about this is can we just keep adding rows here? You know, we can just keep adding rows. So if we wanted to adjust for garages, if we wanted to adjust for bathrooms, if we wanted to adjust for the deck, you know, whatever it happened to be, you can just keep adding rows. And the, the nice thing is, once you've got your adjustments all in place, it's just total up that column and there's your indicated value. So far so good? Making sense? and garages are the source of much confusion on the exam. The reason is not that they, they are confusing. They're not. Bathrooms and garages are not a confusing thing. What's confusing is the way we refer to them. There's no such thing as a half bath, folks. It's the way we've named it but nobody took a chainsaw and cut a bathroom in half. The problem with using the terminology half bath is that you automatically assume that a half bath is worth half of what a full bath is, and it's not. It's not. A half bath is worth significantly more than a half of a full bath, because if you think about it, if we really were being accurate, we should call it a two-thirds bath, right? Because there are three pieces in a full bath, and there are two pieces in a half bath. I don't know which one you would get half of, the sink or the toilet in a half <laughs> bath, but it would be a bad deal either way. Does that make sense to everybody? So, you need to get out of your brain. There's no such thing as a two and a half bath house when you're doing a CMA. There's a house that has two full bathrooms and one half bathroom. In other words, start to mentally separate the two of them because what you're going to be expected to do is make two adjustments. What I'm telling you is you can't adjust, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you the easiest example. My subject property has two and a half baths. My comparable property has three baths. You cannot make that the same by taking away a half bath. A three bath house minus a half bath is not a two and a half bath house. Does that make sense for everybody? Because what you really have is two full baths and one really messed up room. If you do that, that way. So, rather than saying you have a two and a half bath subject, what you have is a subject that has two fulls and what? One half. And you have a comp that has three fulls and zero halves. So you're going to actually adjust twice. You're going to adjust for the full baths, and then you're going to adjust for the half baths. Does that make sense for everybody? They have to be done separately. They cannot be done all at one time. They have to be done separately. So when you talk about adjusting, so let's give our example here. Our subject has a two and a half bath. So let me write down what we'd have here. So we have full baths, we have half baths. And the subject has two full and one half. Notice I separated them out, right? It's not two and a half, it's just two and one. Does everybody see that? Two fulls, one half. What do we have in our comp? Three full and zero, zero half. Everybody with me so far on that? Now it's clear that I need to make both, because both of these lines are unequal, I need to make adjustments on which one, which line? Oh, 
on both of them. It's going to be two adjustments. I'm going to need to know the value of full back, but I'm also going to need to know the value of what? A half back. Because if you look at, for example, the full backs, here's my subject, two. What is my comp half? Three. So which way am I adjusting? Down by what? One full back. So the adjustment on line one would be minus whatever the value of a full is. It's a negative adjustment by the value of a full back. Well, then look at line two. My subject is right here with one half bath. What does my comp have as far as half baths go? Zero, so it's worse. So which way am I adjusting? Up by the value. So what I'm actually doing is taking away the value of a full bath and adding the value of a half bath. Is everybody okay with that? That, that is probably the most complex adjustment you'll make, believe it or not, because it's, we're so conditioned to think, oh, two and a half to three, I just need to add a half bath. No, you don't. Because actually, if you add a half bath, if you take a two and a half bath house and you add a half bath to it, what you have is two fulls and two hats, not three fulls. It's a very different setup. Very different setup. Garages work exactly the same way. A one-car garage is not half of a two-car garage. So if you are comparing a one-car versus a two-car, what you would have is a line item for two-car garages and a separate line item for what? For one-car garage. So like in this, let's say the same property that we were comparing here. Let's say the same property, the subject property has a two-car and the comparable property has a one-car garage. I would have a line item here for two-car garages, and I would have a line item here for one-car garages. And I said the subject property has a two-car. So that would be one two-car garage, right, for the subject. How many two-car garages does the comp have? If it has a one-car garage, how many two-car garages does it have? Zero. Zero. And if the subject has a two-car, how many one-car garages does it have? Zero. But how many does the comp have? One. Notice again, I gotta make how many adjustments? I gotta make two adjustments to even that out. So that's the way you do bathrooms and garages. You just need to separate them out. Yes, ma'am. Do you need to figure out the worth of them before you understand if you're adjusting up and down, or can you just consider generally if there's a two car, it is better than a one car? Two car is better than a one car. Okay, and more full baths are better than more half baths. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Well, you don't worry about are more full baths worth more than more half baths. You worry about more full baths are worth more than less full baths because you only want to compare fulls and fulls and right. halves and halves. Okay. I, I know you meant. Right. I right. just want to make sure I redirect the right way. Language is important. I get it. Okay? Everybody alright so far on how to make those adjustments? We're almost done with the different adjustment types. And then finally, the last piece, the last adjustment, which is actually going to be the first one you do, but I save it till the end because it involves more math than the others, is something called appreciation or depreciation. Appreciation, or, what does appreciation mean? Something has gone what? Up in value. Remember, these comparable properties that you've chosen, we're using what they sold for as a basis of comparison. Does that make sense? What if the market has gone up since they sold? Should we make an adjustment for that? Yes, that would be called an appreciation adjustment. And what do you think, which direction do you think appreciation will go, up or down? Up, that'd be a plus adjustment. And what if the market has gone down since that comparable property sold? Which way would we go? Down. <coughs> Excuse me. We would go down. That would be a de depreciation adjustment. Now, here's where I want to help you along here. We're going to talk about the math in just a second. When you set your chart up, it's actually not going to look like this. The first line, and I just want to get you to discipline yourself. When you set your chart up, your first line is not going to be bathrooms or square footage. Your first line is always going to be appreciation 
or depreciation. And I'll tell you why. It's not that you have to do it first. It's that it's going to protect you against a very common mistake that is made on the exam. Your appreciation or depreciation is always based on the sales price of the comp. Here's what I've seen students do over the past. They do all their other adjustments first, and then they do their appreciation or depreciation based on the new number. Does that make you, you get what I'm saying there? You don't want to adjust your appreciation from this new number. You want to adjust it from the number at the top. So if you do it first, you can't possibly make that mistake because you haven't come up with a new number yet. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So you're going to do it as your first adjustment. So in this example we've got over here, it says a comp sold seven months ago for $280,000 in a neighborhood that has been appreciating at a rate of 4% annually. What is the adjusted value of the comparable property? Well, it's appreciation. So, we, so for example, we had this filled in. Our starting point would be $280,000, right? And our first adjustment is appreciation, and we need seven months because it sold seven months ago, right? So that's how we would fill this in. Now, appreciation, is that going to be plus or minus? Plus. plus. So we always write the direction down first, and then we do the math. It says it's appreciating a rate of 4% annually. Well, we can calculate 4% annually, can we not? Okay, $280,000 times 4% annually, and it's already on the example here for you, is $11,200. Is everybody comfortable with that number? Here's the thing though, that's for a full year. Did it sell a full year ago? No, it sold how long ago? Seven months. So we need to first break that down to monthly and then multiply times seven months. So we would divide that $11,200 by 12 months out of the year. That's $933.33 in monthly appreciation. So this is going to be plus 933, 33 times what? Seven. Times seven. Because we've got seven months worth of it. Does that make sense? And if you do the math there, that's plus 6,533, 31. So plus 65, 33, and 31 cent. And we go right back to our starting point, $280,000 plus 65.33. So that adjusted price or indicated price would be 286.533.31 once you've taken into account the appreciation. It's basically like saying if this same comp sold today, it would sell for how much today? 286.5. If it sold today, it would sell for 286.5. That's what we're adjusting for. That's why you want that number up there at the top. That's why we want to do it at the top because. What ends up happening is if you do all the other adjustments first, sometimes you get carried away and you do this math over here and then say you end up with 275 down here and you do 4% of 275. Is that going to be a different number? See what I mean? So if you remind yourself, I'm always going to do the appreciation. When, when you're setting your chart up, it, just write appreciation as your first adjustment or depreciation. And if it doesn't give it to you in the question, so what? You just leave the line blank. Zero, zero, don't worry about it. But if it does give it to you, it'll be a reminder of do that first. So you don't make that mistake of totaling them up and then doing the appreciation. So we want to do that piece first. All right? One last note, then we'll take our first break and we'll come back and start to work on the math of this. An ideal CMA should have three to five comps. More than five, you need to narrow it down. Less than three, you probably don't have enough. Three to five is an ideal CMA. Um, each one of those is going to give you a separate value. Notice if we set up a chart, each property is going to give us a separate number. Does that make sense? Because each property is sold for a different price. We're going to make adjustments on each property. Each one is going to give us a separate number. Very important for test agent purposes and real world purposes. Do not average those numbers together. If you're using three comps and you've got three different numbers, don't average them. Never average them together. The way we do this is we simply give a range of value. What does a range mean? From the 
lowest to the highest. So if we have three numbers, we say the property is if the, the probable sales price of the property is somewhere what? Between this number, which is our lowest one, and this number, which is our highest one. To go any further than that would be doing an appraisal, an appraisal, and we're not qualified for that. And no, they don't average either. They're not averaging either. They do a different process. It's called correlation. More complex. We're not that smart. <laughs> the, the, the requirements to become an appraiser are substantial in this state. I mean, substantially higher than to become a real estate broker. Uh, and for example, to even take the appraisal classes, you have to have a four year degree. You don't even have to have a high school diploma to take this class. Whether you'd be successful or not is you know, another thing to debate, but it's not required. Um, whereas you have to have a four-year degree to even take an appraisal class, and then once you have completed the class, you have to be a trainee and do approximately 200 appraisals before you can work on your You have to be a trainee on approximately 200 before you work on your own. So, you know, I, I, I completely respect that they are far more trained than we are as far as valuation goes. And that's why we just stop when we get to that range of value. There's not a lot of people that actually are in that profession, right? It's a tough one to get into. It takes a very long time. I mean, if you look at somebody start and finish from the day they walk into a class to the day they can actually do appraisals on their own, by the time they go through that apprenticeship program, it usually takes about two years before you make any money in it. So there's not a lot of people who are willing to invest that amount of time that it takes to get there. How much do they usually Depends on how many appraisals they do a week. I mean, the average the average they make on an appraisal is about three hundred and fifty dollars for a, a home appraisal. They usually they usually charge about four fifty, but the bank keeps the, no, I shouldn't say the bank. The appraisal management companies, which are conveniently owned by the banks, um, keep uh, a uh, share of that. The way the way appraisals work on the home side is the appraiser basically registers with an appraisal management company that, that says, okay, I do appraisals in this area, and then the appraisals are randomly assigned. Um, that is supposed to protect the consumer. Um, in, in other words, that way banks don't have like favorite appraisers that they know will meet their number type thing, you know, so the appraisal is randomly assigned. But the appraisal management company keeps part of the money as a result of setting the thing up. So I think it's $350 to $375 per deal but a good appraiser, depending on the area, um, can do 10 a week on the residential side. So it can be lucrative. But remember, they got to visit all those properties. That's a lot of running around. It's a lot of running around, a lot of measuring. That changed uh, with the Dodd-Frank Act in so 2011. All right, we good on that? Let's take our first break. When we come back, we'll get into math package. Okay?